than raise your hand using the button or any other means, please just say in the comments if you wish to speak. Um, welcome to this calling meeting of the Place Scrutiny Board. Um, I'm going to start off by asking for substitutes and uh, any apologies for this meeting. Do we have any apologies or substitutes nominated? No, no um, apologies and no substitutes, Chair. Marvellous, didn't think so. Um, at this point, I'm going to remind councillors that they have the opportunity now or throughout the meeting to declare if they have any disclosory pecuniary or other interests which would prevent them from participating in any discussions of any items or participating in any votes of any, on any items. Uh, does anyone currently have any uh, disclosable pecuniary interests they wish to mention now? Please feel free if it comes up during the meeting, you think you should have declared something, just uh, stick your hand up or stick it in the comments. Um, this is an appropriate meeting to uh, to admit the public to, so uh, that is why we are now streaming live on YouTube. Uh, moving on to the uh, future council delivery plan, which is the decision that has been called in. Um, I'm going to ask the, those who called in the, meet, the item to speak first, um, and then I'm going to move on to uh, the cabinet members and the officers. Um, I'd like to thank so many cabinet members and officers for giving up their Tuesday evening this evening for, to join us. So I believe, and sorry I wasn't uh, originally chairing this, but I believe it was uh, Councillor Mrs Carter and Councillor Lee that called this in, is that correct? Yeah. Okay, I'm going to go, I'll let you choose your order. I've seen that Stephen, so Councillor Lee has unmuted himself, so I assume that you wish to speak first. So if I go Councillor Lee and then Councillor Mrs Carter, and then I will go to the Cabinet, starting with Councillor Dacre. So if we can go first to Councillor Lee, please. Just uh, on a point of procedure, Chair, I realise you've stepped in at a very late stage. Um, Councillor Caffrey is a member of the Place Shooting mm -hmm. Board. And so he is the person that's called it in, supported oh. by myself and Councillor Carter. So what I'd like to do, assuming that George doesn't come back in the time that we've got ahead of us, <coughs> is for Councillor Caffrey to uh, address the meeting first as the official person that called it in. I'll then follow Peter and then Councillor Carter will, uh, will follow me. Uh, uh, Councillor Blackburn might want to say something then as well, if possible. What, so what I might try to do then, uh, Councillor Lee, is to, after I've had the three initial callers in speak, I will go to the Cabinet, then I'll go to members of the board, and then I'll go to other councillors present. I'm aware that there's more than one who isn't on the board, just in order that we get allow people to have a say. Sorry about uh, that. I couldn't remember who put their name on the call in, so sorry no, about that. No Catherine. problem. That's absolutely, that's absolutely fair. Thank you. Councillor Caffrey. Thank you, Councillor Lee. That's very generous of you to put me on the stand. Thank you. I appreciate it. <laughs> Um, I'm not going to go through the whole of this paper because I'm sure it'll come up during the course of the evening. Um, I think my, my main concern about it is um, we're looking for savings, but we're never going to, never going to materialise based on historic performance. I, I'm concerned that a while we're in this position, and b if it'll ever if it'll work anyway. Um, my concern is that the council's expecting the public to take the brunt of these cuts in services. But what's missing is what contribution the council's going to make and what sacrifices it's made. Um, we've been told the funding gap was, was caused by, it's caused by the lack of funding from the government. But this government, I think, has probably been the most generous on record. I understand that this council um, didn't furlough any staff. That might, might be wrong, I'm corrected if it's wrong. So the subsidy we could have had if we didn't is foregone. So it's not the government's fault if we didn't take advantage of that. 
I mean, many people out there, and these are people who are sort of aiming this at, are losing the jobs and the livelihoods. I mean, we've got Arcadia going bust today, and we've got, I think, at least three Arcadia shops. And these people are the ones that are paying the council's wage bill. And now getting a double whammy because the services have been cut and they haven't got a job either. So I'll be concerned about the people on the street who are actually funding or, or you know, the way the council operates. I think the other concern, I know you're sick of hearing this, um, but, Councillor Scullion, but the council is a reckless borrower and spender. And I mean, it, it's a thing we keep coming up with because it's out of control. We keep hearing about savings, but they never come. And we're borrowing to save, but we never save. And I mean, I'm just wondering when these endless savings are going to, to feed through into the actual budgets and, you know, if we prevent where we are now. I mean, you know, if you was on prudential borrowing it already, there's no point in re-emphasising those because it's never to be, it's ne yet to be demonstrated how much of it is prudential. If it is, where's the evidence? There's no audit trail of project viability. And somebody said they would produce that for me and nobody ever asked to show that the borrowed funding actually delivers the savings and provides capital repayments. If the council was more prudent, we wouldn't be having this meeting. Um, I mean, we use borrowed money to buy fuel stations in flood zones when electric cars on the horizon. I mean, that's got to take some kind of prize. Um, the report provides lots of details about staffing numbers, but gives no indication of how we're going to use these to reduce the staffing bill. But it's pretty clear on how the public would be disadvantaged by it all. Um, in fact, talking of wasting money, I don't know who's seen this today. It's, I think it's gone through everybody's door. And I mean, some of the comments I've had, and I don't want this cost... Well, I've had some stick over it. I can't use that terminology because it's it's not fit for Zoom. But patronising was the most generous. I mean, all this stuff in here is on telly every night. People are sick of hearing it. But somebody has decided to put it in a leaflet and say to every door in Colville at some vast expense. Now, if you've given this, the, fund, the money for this frontline service to deliver some more street cleaning or road servicing or something, so who on earth decided to waste all this money on that? I have no idea. Um, we keep using the word equality. It's bounded about like nobody's business. But it doesn't seem to fit into these proposals. Um, people are being told to make sacrifices, but the council seems to be carrying as normal, which, which doesn't seem equal to me. And I really think we need some levelling up. And we shouldn't expect residents to swallow all this if the council are not prepared to make sacrifices and improve its grasp of finances. So really all I'm saying is, I'm not going to go into the nitty gritty of what we're doing. I mean, I accept some, some areas are, are ripe for, for changing and putting and, and streamlining and improving. But the things we're talking about here are like mainline services, like waste services and, and sub libraries and things. So I really think we need to put our own house, in, our own house in order and demonstrate we have before we start telling the public they've got to get another hit. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Caffrey. Councillor Lee. Thank you, Chair. Yes, um, any, everybody that saw the calling will have seen um, that we've, we've asked for the reshaping of these council services to be put on hold. Um, that we shouldn't delegate authority. They're very serious, swinging cuts to public services uh, and the consultations should be put in place before pr proceeding with a delivery plan. You know the standard practice is to consult first and decide later so what's happened here is it's all been the wrong way around and under difficult circumstances of having to have meetings by Zoom and all the rest of it we were, we were given information just days before the first meeting that we had, which would, would have been impossible to read and digest and fully comprehend in the time available. So there's been a lack of information, a lack of consultation, a lack of proper costings. And as Councillor Caffrey so eloquently just stated, we we're genuinely concerned for the residents of Calderdale about this. We're not playing games with it. So I am going to give you some numbers this evening about where I believe the problems lie and where 
perhaps in the future we can change our ways and uh, do things differently. So last, last night I went to the audit meeting of, of, the, of the council um, and I take, I take the, ju the duties very seriously on that group. Um, and I think, I believe it does a great job. And going through the various reports, I came upon one item that I really wanted to communicate to all of the um, members of this scrutiny board this evening, because genuinely I was horrified at the numbers. And I'll go to the paragraph and I'll read it. You don't need to look anything up, I don't think, because there's just one or two numbers on there that are relevant. So this is a uh, heading. Uh, the, the, uh, the report was half year report on treasury management to the 30th of September. Remember that 30th of September. Um, borrowing long-term paragraph eight, three, so the total amount of long-term debt outstanding at the 30th of September was 113 million 400 and odd, 113 million pounds. Uh, it goes on to say it's changed by 100,000 pounds as it was in March. Now it's significant that 100,000 because that's all of the uh, principal payments have been on that £113,415,000 that we owe, 100 grand. Um, but it then goes on, and this is the really worrying, harrowing part. The amount of interest paid on that long-term debt in the period was a tad over £2 million. Now, I asked for clarification about this at the meeting, that that was indeed for six months, and it, it was. So I think as these things go, it's reasonable to assume, as I take you through the numbers, that in 12 months, that would be around £4 million. So just stick with me on that. I don't think that's unreasonable. So £4 million is the interest payment on this prudential borrowing. As Councillor Caffrey said, it's actually probably, when you hear these numbers, it's a misnomer, it's reckless borrowing. So four million pounds interest. Now, the amount of that 100,000 pounds paying off um, the, uh, the principal, you know, double that to 200,000 pounds for a full year, we're repaying let's say a hundred million pounds, just to make the numbers dead easy, that would take 500 years to repay. So the reality is that since the longest term for prudential borrowing, or I'll just say borrowing, I can't bear to say prudential, the longest term is 50 years. So if you owe a hundred million pounds, and you've got 50 years to pay it back, it's fair to assume you should pay back a couple of million every year. That's how mortgages work, that's how loans work, everybody knows that. So it should be that we're paying, we should be paying around six million to service this debt. And if you think about it, and you know, money that, that's available, if you owe a hundred something, um, it might well cost uh, 6% in total to service the, uh, the debt. So, but we're not. We're not paying back any of the capital. We're just in a horrible escalating cycle here now of borrowing more money without repaying off the capital and spending huge amounts of, of money. And just messing about with the numbers, we should be servicing that with six million pounds a year, that debt. Let's just say for ease of numbers, it was 5.2 million. 
it, you know, it's 800,000 less than it might be, but if it was 5.2 million, it's easy because it's 100,000 pounds a week. 5.2 million, 100 grand a week. It's what footballers earn. Um, so 100,000 pounds a week is seven days, it's 14,000 pounds a day. And if you take it to an hourly rate, it's 600 pounds an hour that we're committed to, to get rid of this debt and pay the interest for 50 years. And just because 600 pounds an hour is easily divisible, every minute costs 10 pounds as a council, but not just tonight for two hours, 1200 pounds for a meeting of this uh, scrutiny panel for two hours, maybe. But every single day and every year for 50 years, we've got that to pay back now. And it is relevant that this figure was at the end of um, September, because since then, at the last two or so, either cabinet meetings or full council meetings, we've committed to about another 5 million. So it's near 120 million now. And as we've heard, we're not paying any of it back. So what I think is that the problem here is we're trying to claw back savings of maybe two million pounds on essential services that the people of Calderdale deserve. And we can't afford to do that because we're paying huge amounts of money and committed to paying huge amounts of money for years, three times what we're aiming to save with these cuts, on borrowing. And we, we obviously can't afford it. If we could afford it, we wouldn't be making cuts. So we can't carry on borrowing. And if we get that right, we can then start to look at, at revenue spending in a different light. We'll have a lot more to play with. But we've been crippled by this borrowing and it's gone up and up in recent years. I'm, I'm not in the blame game. Um, you know, people come and people go. Various people have been responsible for projects and uh, regeneration. Certainly not the fault of the person, persons involved in that, either on the council, um, on, in the Labour group, or uh, as an officer. It's, it's done. But we've got to actually get a grip on this now. And I really think that that's where the problem lies. And when the leader of the council says to me in a, a laughing tone, let's see what you come up with at budget time. Well, actually, it's more complicated than picking things out of a hat to try and find small savings because we're heading in absolutely the wrong direction as a council. And I say this, not wearing a political hat, I know about business, if you've got debt and you're not paying it back and you're spending all your money servicing the debts, you're not going to have any money to do anything else. And that's where the problem lies. So I do call upon uh, this scrutiny board to consider these facts and just hold back and accept our proposition that reshaping council services should be put on hold until we can all get round the table. And I genuinely mean that. All parties, I'm happy to do that. I think this council is in trouble and we need to get a grip on it before it goes any further. Thank you, Chair. Might I suggest, um, I know that, uh, that I said that I'd go through all of the people who had the, um, who put the, their name on the call in first. There's some very specific stuff about the uh, the kind of long-term prudential borrowing um, that felt to me to be kind of addressed to a lot of the areas that I think Councillor Scullion's been working on. I wonder if, um, and excuse me for taking Vice Chair's privilege here, uh, if we could quickly go to Councillor Scullion just to answer on that specific point, but 
ideally not a much wider point because I'd like to uh, then go to uh, Councillor Carter and then go to Councillor Dacre on things like the furlough scheme and the other issues that have been raised. Um, but I just wonder if just particularly on that, on that, on, on that particular point, uh, Councillor Scorian wouldn't mind just saying a couple of words and then I'll go on to Councillor Carter and then go to Councillor Dacre um, to start the response, if that makes sense. Um, please feel free to overrule me if uh, you don't wish to talk about potential borrowing, uh, Councillor Scullion. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, and this is a complex area, and I think it's useful just to have a bit of clarification at this point. And Councillor Lee would be absolutely right if some of the basic premises were absolutely right. And I would refute um, the idea that this is a reckless council um, that is recklessly borrowing. And at the same audit committee that Councillor Lee was at last night, the external auditors, Ernst and Young, signed off the council's account and they gave us a judgment that this council was very good value for money. And indeed, as part of the papers for that audit committee was the um, council borrowing the aged debt of the council over a number of years, which showed, and I think actually um, the uh, chief of finance yesterday uh, went into some detail after you had made those points in terms of the different ways in which prudential borrowing was calculated on a, on a daily basis. And I know it makes very good headlines to say, um, uh, 500 years to repay this and so on. Let me say again, and I apologise for repeating this, that um, in terms of our prudential borrowing, as it's conventionally called in public sector finance, 75% of that is actually covered by the money coming back in. It pays for itself. So only 25% of that prudential borrowing might fall upon the taxpayer. Um, I think that's very far from um, being reckless that we try not to borrow um, any money at all, to be honest, but we inherit borrowing from years ago and we know that interest rates change day by day. And indeed the Public Works uh, Lending Board has actually just reduced the interest rates back down to 1%. Um, so in terms of reckless spending at 1% over, over 40 years, we are very, very conscious of the revenue consequences of prudential borrowing in this council. And I was very pleased yesterday that the external auditors gave us a clean bill, bill of health. And they, I know Councillor Caffrey has heard this before, but in terms of where we sit as a metropolitan council, we are a low borrowing council. Um, I would like to though draw members attention to what I think are the real reasons for the financial position. The first of those is, of course, COVID. We are in the middle of a pandemic. Um, and that means that our income has actually absolutely gone, gone, gone through the floor. Um, you know, for example, a million pounds worth of income. Sorry, that Councillor we, Scullion, yeah, I'm sorry. going to cut you off. Um, yes, do, I, I'm sorry. I had asked you just to answer that kind of specific yes, point. I beg your uh, pardon, Chair and committee. Yeah. So I, what I will do, I'll go to Councillor Mrs Carter next. Um, just to let everyone know, and then I'm going to go to Councillor Dacre, uh, at which point I'm going to hand over to Councillor Robinson as chair and he can do look, look more toward the, uh, the board members section of it. So just for everyone, all, all the uh, George Robinson fans who are looking forward to him chairing again, um, that's, when, that's when you get him back. So um, I will go to Councillor Mrs Carter, then I'm going to go to Councillor Dacre, um, and let the um, the various the three cabinet members who we've got here and the officers um, kind of with any responses that they wish to have, and then I'm going to hand over uh, to George, who uh, will take his rightful place as chair of this meeting. So, Councillor Mrs. Carter, and you're to be congratulated for being much better on your computer than George's. <laughs> uh, result folk can do something right now and again, you know. I, I did have to. Uh, I had occasion to speak to an officer on Monday who couldn't get the, the at attachment that I kept sending her. And she said, you haven't sent it me. I said, I have, I have. I said, 
look at the last email you've just sent me. She said, why? I said, well, is the three little blue dots in a little grey box underneath your name? She said, yes. I said, well, click on it. Oh, she said, I didn't know you could do that. I said, there you are, look, attachments, three times over. So I don't need to look at them once. She said, oh, dear. But anyway, so yes, we do come in useful now and again. We have as useless. Right. Um, to get back to the nitty gritty, after a little bit of frivolity. Um, I wasn't going to say anything on prudential borrowing or anything remotely at all like that. But I mean, you've left me nowhere to go, Councillor Scullion. And I'm going to have to say, aren't I, that the 25% out of council tax if we hadn't got it, we wouldn't be having to make these, these service, public service cuts. Anyway, the, I'm not, I won't be any more uh, mischievous than that. <clears throat> I did now read the Cabinet minutes, uh, which I hadn't done prior to count Council last Wednesday, and I apologise for that. So I now do know absolutely categorically I will not be mentioning waste recycling and collection, uh, because I now have picked up where that's going to be dealt with. So I will definitely leave that one alone. Um, various concerns that I mentioned at Cabinet the last time around looking at Cabinet papers, and one of them was community asset transfer. Um, <clears throat> correct me if I'm wrong, and I might be wrong, because it's that long since community asset transfer was put into the, the, the statute. Um, am I right in thinking that where there is a community asset transfer, the ward councillors are to be involved in that process of discussion with with what's going on and with prospective groups that might be going to get involved into that community asset transfer that it wasn't just leaving us out in the cold so we didn't know what was happening now I don't know whether anybody wants to answer that before I go any further or not but I, that was a view that I had and um, I am concerned about the library paper and community asset transfer and also the public post paper and community asset transfer. So I think I need to answer that, go into that one in a bit more detail as to why I'm concerned. It is now December. For a community, for a parish council to get engaged with a community asset transfer at this stage, there is only three months. The chances of that being happening is remote. But if the rationale behind a community asset transfer is still what I think it is, that it has to be of a use for more than one organisation. Like Hebden Bridge Town Hall covers the town council plus loads of other people, plus a small business here and there, plus various other community projects, plus the cafe and things. I know when I was working with, with Cabroid Football that they were not um, allowed to do that community asset transfer because they couldn't actually categorically state at what point other, other community activity could take place within that facility. So they were not meeting the criteria, which leads me on to the library. The last time when I was on the parish council that was looked at for Rippenden Library with regards to this community asset transfer, you had to make sure that you've got other organisations in the community involved. If you've been in Rippenden Library, you will see you can't swing a cat round in it. If the, if the parish council moved into there from the premises that they currently have, which is what was on the cards before, it wouldn't be a facility that could be just open to any Tom Dick Canary to be able to go in at any time. Likewise, the library bit. And there's nowhere to, to cut all this off and make the actual room itself a meeting room without there being some form of... of um, stewardship there you couldn't just let anybody in at any time so I am I am very concerned about that process of community asset transfer and if organizations are fully appreciative of actually what they are signing up to and this is about the libraries it's about this the public halls as well and I would like some clarity if at all possible and as a ward councillor where something is happening on those lines, it would be useful if I had some idea about what is going on. I represent the community as a whole, and not just uh, from a parish perspective. But I do know from getting the parish council papers, there is still no, no reports about how it's going to work, what is needed, what's required. I haven't seen anything from the parish council agendas as yet. So I am somewhat concerned about how this can work and the impact that it will have on the community. 
I have actually seen a budget paper. Um, I won't tell you what that says because it's not my paper. It's something I've read today and it's nothing to do with me. But to tell you it's scary, it's scary. But anyway, we'll leave it at that for now. Um, so this, I think there needs to be some more clarity about how this is going to work. It's not just as simple as officers working with, with organisations to try and do it. There's a lot more involved in that. And I think we've got to be careful how far we go. I cannot see, quite honestly, how any organisation can actually commit to taking on a community asset transfer in the first three months of this next year and have it up and running for the 1st of April. I just do not think that is possible. I think that there is just not the timescales to be able to do that from what my feelings are on the matter. So that's from a library perspective. Um, the next thing I'm, I'll, I really wish to highlight is about... Do you mind if I pause you quickly on that, on that, on that yeah. point, Councillor Mrs Carter? I'm just yeah. wondering if Councillor Lynn uh, is able, I know that you've been dealing with the community asset transfer and library issue. Are you able just to quickly take us through the kind of process that we're going to be pursuing with that? I know we had a discussion at this very committee. You're still muted, by the way. Um, we had a discussion at this com committee um, this week, last week. I don't know, all times merged into one. Um, last week about the library issue. So I just wonder if you could quickly go through the process just to see if that helps Councillor Mrs Carter. And then and then I believe you're about to go on to Sewers, so we'll then go back to, to, to that point, OK? OK. You're still on mute. Sorry, Sorry. I, apologies, Chair. Uh, you see, Zeke, I forgot you much better than this game. Um, yes, you're quite right. Um, it is important that ward councillors are involved, and you and I, I would certainly hope that you will be involved in any discussions, um, substantive discussions about what's happening in relation to Rippenden Library. Um, when we gave a timescale of saying that um, there will be three months for people to for, for organisations to um, to look at bringing forward a, a proposal, it's to bring forward an outline proposal. The position at the moment is that our um, Community Assets and Facilities Management section of the Council are busy preparing information packs which they can give out to organisations such as parish councils and other organisations that are interested and those will be available um, by, by the end of this month really and that will then give, give organisations three months in which to think about whether they wish to put forward an expression of interest. That doesn't necessarily mean that it all it, that all the I's have to be um, dotted and the T's crossed. And the other point to add is that we've had a commitment from the um, Voluntary Sector Infrastructure Alliance, VSI Alliance, um, that they will uh -huh. offer support to any organisation. And I'm very grateful to them for that. So just to reassure you um, that, uh, that as far as the actual process is concerned, what we're saying to any organisations that have got an interest in it is by all means in, approach us informally but formally, we will be writing to you if you've indicated um, your interest. We will be writing to you to give you an information pack, and then you can you can do some thinking about it. Clearly, if you have a parish council, which is an already um, very long-standing group, then in a sense that group doesn't have to have to establish its bona fides. In other areas, it might be that there isn't such a such an organisation, and then the VSI Alliance would work with them to try to help them establish something. Um, as far as the issue about the individual library that you're most familiar with is concerned, Rippenden Library. Um, obviously, we'd be happy. We will be happy to to work with um, with the parish council if the parish council wants to take it forward to think about not necessarily about subdividing the room or anything. Because you're quite right, it's not a big it's not a big building. Um, but actually, to consider whether there might be um, there might be opportunities for shared use and so on. I can't comment on what you said about the. Um, about the playing fields because I wasn't involved in that. Um, but certainly you're absolutely right, Councillor Carter, that it is a requirement of our um, council community asset transfer policy that an organisation to which a public asset is transferred should be able to demonstrate added public value. In other words, that they're doing something more than what they were doing anyway. Um, so I hope that helps. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry for interrupting there, Mrs. Carr. Carter. That's that's just clarified. It's just clarified everything that I thought I had right, um, which is even more scary than ever. And not to forget that if a parish council decides they're going to take something on, 
they can't necessarily have the I's dotted and the T's crossed at this moment in time at the same, to, to a certain degree, they have to do, have those dotted and crossed because the only way they can make it function is to set a preset. And as you are aware, the budget has to be set by February. So you've got to set the preset to bring you the income in to be able to manage the, the building that you're taking over because you haven't got the resources at hand to be able to do it. So you have a catch 22. So you're going to have to set the preset first. How can you set a preset for something that you don't have? Because that is not lawful either. So to get this up and running for a town or parish council prior to the 1st of April, I would suggest is not a possible outcome. It'd have to be the following year. Because quite frankly, if the parish council set a preset of some significant amount of money to operate this library for next year and the plan the things weren't in place what are they going to do with the preset money that they've set that they're not going to use mm, don't know that'd be a question for somebody else to answer which is i mean that is the same i guess with bring our civic hall the size of that building the size of that that facility with regards to the impact that that's got from a tourism perspective in bring house as well and, and the infrastructure of Brig House as a town, it would have absolutely nothing as in a town of that type of that size um, as a public hall amenity. Um, we know Todd has the Hippodrome and it has the town hall as well, so it has two. I know the Hippodrome is privately owned. Halifax has privately owned facility in the Playhouse. But Brig House doesn't have that facility in the town centre that those two places have got. So they would end up with a civic hall. And the other question for the civic hall, which I don't really understand is, who owns the block that the civic hall sits in? Because it's not just about the civic hall, it's about all the shops underneath and the whole block of the building. Is that all council owned? So we're not talking about disposing of Brighouse Civic Hall in its entire, in its, in this, as a singular use. We're talking about disposing of a significant building in the centre of Brig House that has a significant number of shops on a high street. Big impact is that one because of course the Civic Hall is on the first floor. So not just, I am not clear um, from the papers that we've been given about the proposals for Brig House Civic Hall as well as to how that can actually function and what the implications are uh, for that, it's not just a case of taking, for me, taking over the use of the hall and the operation of the hall. It's about, as a council, the whole block and the ownership. So I'd, I'd like some clarity about where that sits in the scheme of things for Brig House. But as I mentioned before, the community use Brig House Civic Hall significantly now and um, for, for big events that they do for their special festivals weeks and for other community organisations to, to use um, for their shows and things. And of course, now they've got a mainline train coming in, the London train coming into Brighouse has made one heck of a difference to the amount of tourists that come into Brighouse and, and how they operate that festivals week. Okay. So, uh, there are, there, for me, there are, there, it, there's not just about the hall in its entirety, it's about looking at the whole of the, the, of the area and what it's used for and, and okay. the impact. Can of not we having that. just quickly move beyond the Civic Hall? Yes, um, I'm I don't going, think it's I'm, on this call in. So I, I'm yeah. going to mud, muddle on to next thing on the agenda, which is um, the tourist information officers. I know I'm singing alone, I know I'm banging the lone bell here, yeah, but. I do think that they are important. I think that the front face of the council are out of office hours. There is no other office, no other council office that is open on a Saturday and a Sunday. They are our front face in the place like Hebden Bridge, which is a tourism place, which is operating on a Sunday big style. You know, it's been on the news lately. It was on the news last week. Chris Sands was on with it because um, it was about the markets and everything else and the way that Hebden Bridge is functioning. I think it's so important that the council has a front face there and I think the tourist information office does a fantastic job and besides doing the tourism stuff it does have the, the gifts that people can buy and I think Kevin Bridge without the, the tourist information office will be a very a very sad day when that that occurs and as I keep saying 
I am computer literate, but there are times when a piece of paper in your hand from a tourist information office is a lot more useful when you're trying to find your way around somewhere. I, I'm sorry, but you know, you can't use a mobile phone and use a laptop when you're driving. And somebody at the side of you can actually use a piece of paper and say turn left, right, or whatever. It makes life a lot easier. So I do think that they have a place to pay, a, a, a somewhere to pay um, a significant part in the council's work. And also not forgetting, you know, the, the PSO. Um, I do think we've got to look at, we've got to look at some way and means of making these being able to be functional. And I'm no longer a director of, um, of Pennine Prospects, but I know that it has been an absolute fantastic home for Pennine Prospects over the over a number of years. And of course, if that went in Hebden Bridge, then they'd have to find another home. So um, it is an an important part of the work and the partnership work that we do um, with regards to the South Pennines. Um, markets. Ooh. I've been around the world with markets this last week. I had a Zoom meeting all around Europe with uh, Germany, uh, Spain, France, Italy, Portugal, Serbia, Greece. It was lovely last Thursday afternoon. I went all around Europe and they're all locked down even worse than we are. And we're in a lot better position than them, but I had a lovely uh, round the world markets meeting. Um, markets are so important. And I know it was mentioned again at council last week, there has to be an understanding by councillors that there is an issue around uh, the car boat. And, you know, the rest of the markets, I think apart from the borough market, which had always been the, um, the center of, of, of the world in markets, there's, which are struggling, the rest are doing a fantastic job. I went past Ellen last week and it's as bigger and better and fantastic, loads of people there. It's absolutely a delight to see. And I would hate our markets to be suffering uh, at all um, through any, any, any savings other than the car boat, which I think would make, to me, the car boat would make sense. Um, I think I'll leave it at that chair for now. Um, there are lots of things in this paper that I'm disappointed with. As you know, I mentioned this scal. I don't want to see a scal go. I don't want to see the things that they do disappear, which they would do because I don't know who else to take it on. And I think we do a, a really fantastic job at our little bit towards helping vulnerable people with disability. And I would hate to see a scal disappear. I'd like to see some business work done with a scal to try and see if we can do something to keep it going even more with a partnership with a private company, say, for example, I don't know. But I would love to see your scale stay within the council. Thank you very much. Thank you, Council, Mrs Carter. Right, there's quite a lot to cover there. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go first to Councillor Dacre, um, spooling way back to Councillor Caffrey starting this off. He mentioned uh, specifically the issues around furlough, he mentioned the issues around equality um, and kind of making sure that we're levelling up um, and looked at that, that stuff. Um, there was then Councillor Lee who largely spoke on the debt, but if you've got any kind of further reflections on what he spoke on, that would be useful. And then Councillor Carter, um, who spoke on the uh, libraries, although Councillor Lynn has responded to some of that. She also spoke on the markets um, and, and, and the town halls now i think probably the town halls might be councillor scullion um so what i'm going to do is i'm going to go oh sorry it's councillor lynn um, what i'm going to do is i'm going to go councillor dacre councillor lynn and then councillor scullion um, and at that point i'm going to open it up to uh board members first and then in the secondarily other councillors who wish to speak so um if we then go, yeah, so if we go in that order, that'd be great. Please, can I remind people if they wish to speak, mention in the comments, um, and please do not hold the debate in the comments. Uh, it's not very accessible, particularly for those who are watching us on YouTube. Councillor Dacre. Yes, so just to, there's some comments that I'd like to make in any event, but just to start with questions that were raised. So starting, um, with you, Councillor Caffrey. <clears throat> um, you suggested that the council should look at itself first before making its residents suffer. And 
I'm sorry, but this council has saved, ha had to find savings of about 115 million over the last 10 years. It's lost over a third of its staff. That's people who are no longer employed by the council. It's quite clear from the future council papers that it is ex likely that further staff are going to lose their jobs or have to be redeployed in the coming years. So I think it's quite upsetting to council officers and staff to hear the suggestion that somehow they have been insulated from the last 10 years of austerity and that they're going to be insulated from cuts in the near future as well, because it simply isn't true. Councillor Caffrey also suggested that we were reckless borrowers and made save, promised savings that never came. Well, again, we have made those savings. I've just um, referred to them. In terms of reckless borrowing, uh, this, was, uh, this was also raised by Councillor Lee and dealt with in part by Councillor Scullion. But again, I would refute absolutely the suggestion that it's reckless. Our financial officer would never allow us to be reckless. And it's frankly, I'd suggest insulting to him to suggest that he would. And we are not spending all of our income in paying off um, the prudential borrowing that we do have. It's been quoted before, but SIPFA have said that our external debt is the second lowest of all metropolitan districts and our interest payments are the third lowest of all metropolitan districts as a proportion of our budget. So we are not spending all our income on paying um, interest. Now, it's suggested uh, by Councillor Caffrey, just to rather uh, perhaps a slightly less uh, major point, but that the council has wasted money on the information leaflet that it sent round. Well, I'd suggest to Councillor Caffrey that he hasn't heard from everyone and the only people who are likely to contact him are likely to be people who are incensed by it. I think you'll find that a lot of people will find that it is actually clear, it's well presented and it provides useful information for people. Not everybody spends all their time watching television and not everybody will have had this information in other forms. So I would suggest it was actually an extremely responsible use of the council's money to try and offer helpful information to people at a very difficult time. So I think moving on in, uh, just to, to another point raised by Councillor Lee, where he said that um, it wasn't reasonable to expect um, him or the other opposition councillors to come up with little ideas for saving money. Well, we as the Labour cabinet don't have the luxury of sitting back and saying, oh, well, we can't think of any ideas. We'll just have to let it go. We have had to make those difficult decisions. We have had to look at absolutely everything. And we are looking at absolutely everything, both in discretionary and strategy services, in order to try to find savings. And we, as I say, we don't have the luxury of sitting back and saying, oh, well, we can't think of anything. Um, just moving on to Councillor Carter's queries, I think they've primarily been answered, but I did just um, was looking at something at one point and wasn't quite sure whether Councillor Lynn did make it clear for the benefit, not particularly of you, Councillor Carter, but other people who might be watching, that when it comes to asset transfers, all that is needed by the 31st of March is an expression of interest to the Council. The Council will, will then cabinet will then look at those expressions of interest and if it's felt that there is going to be added value and it looks like there is a prospect of that expression of interest being realistic then uh, work can be started on a business case but in, in which council officers will assist organizations and I know and I've said this before I know from the asset transfer in Todmorden the officers have gone over and above in their efforts to work through the process with um, a group in Todmorden. And I'm sure they'll do the same again with any new groups. And the fact that they're going to put this package together should actually make it a lot easier for people in the future. So it's just that reassurance that you don't need your business plan all tied up in ribbon by the 31st of March. It's expressions of interest only. 
<clears throat> and I think that um, in terms of uh, the remaining points, it, it's just um, it, just to make a comment really in relation to the visitor information centres. I do appreciate that some of us like visitor information centres. I quite like going into them, but the fact of the matter is that lots of people now live online lives and they get all their information online. And whilst it's nice to be able to go in and pick up a few leaflets, what happens with me anyway is I go in, I pick up a few leaflets, and two years later, I find those leaflets in a pile somewhere and I have to throw them out. And they are just not, unfortunately, the way in which most people get their information and or even that most people would necessarily buy the gifts because they can, again, they buy them online. That's how people buy things now. So I think, yes, it's a shame that we have to do it, but they run at a loss, even though they sell gifts and do make money. And we've had to make that difficult decision that it's not um, appropriate to carry on with those two. Now, it doesn't mean, again, as in all of these cases, that we can't work with groups who might be able to take over those functions. But as far as the council's concerned, they can't afford uh, to do so. Um, so, Chair, if I could just make a, a few uh, more general points. We're asked in the calling to put our decisions on hold. And I would just say it's simply not a prudential or a responsible course of action for the council. We all know we've got underlying cost pressures that even without the additional burden of COVID, and we knew that we were already having to make savings in this year, and we were expecting to make say, having to make savings next year as well, and that we weren't able to move as fast as we intended with some of those savings because of COVID. And we all, and I have mentioned this before, but the local government association, that cross-party body, said that just to maintain services as they are, we, councils across the country needed 10.1 billion up to 23-24, plus a 2% council tax rise and inflation. Just, and that's just to stand still. So as a responsible Labour cabinet, we didn't want to not make cuts at this stage and find ourselves in a few months time or in six, nine, 12 months time, having to go to the government and say, oh, sorry, we're running out of money because we wouldn't make those difficult decisions that we didn't really want to make several months ago. It might be suggested that now we're being a bit hasty because we've had the comprehensive spending review and there are additional funds for local authorities contained within that review, but we're still in an uncertain position we don't have the actual precise details of the local government settlement until later this month. We don't know until later this month what our share of the 1.5 billion additional COVID funding will be. The government has yet again failed to provide a long term funding solution for adult social care. And yet again, they've pushed the burden for that onto council taxpayers so that we have the Hobson's choice of raising council tax by 3% to pay for adult social care. That's a very difficult decision. And that decision hasn't been made. And until it's made, we don't know what impact that's going to have on the budget. We now know that we're getting 75% of lost council tax and business rates, that we those that we can't collect. But we still have to find the remaining 25% and our losses are going to carry on for some considerable time. We still don't know whether there's going to be a deal with the EU and what the impact of that deal might be, or indeed the impact if we don't get a deal. We still don't know what the outcome of the fairer funding review is going to be because that's been pushed back to next year and it may alter the, our revenue grant in the future. Our income losses are carrying on. They're going to carry on well into next year. And we know already that we don't get full compensation for those. So we really, again, we have to keep stressing that we simply can't wait before we start making these cuts. 
savings from some of these cuts take a long time to come through, particularly in full. And the longer we wait, the longer we leave it, because we don't want to make these difficult decisions, the longer it is before we can actually start making those savings. So sadly, the situation remains very much as it was when we set off with the Future Council Phase 1 and Phase 2 papers. There are substantial unknowns, there's underlying cost pressures, and next year is going to continue to be overshadowed by COVID. So we've had to take some very difficult, but we say responsible decisions to ensure that we can get as close as possible to some full year savings next year. So that is the context in which those papers uh, came to cabinet. And that's the context that I would ask you all to bear in mind when you are querying the decisions made. Thank okay. you. Um, now, councillors Caffrey and Mrs Carter both want to come back. Um, I don't intend to have a kind of backward and forward for too long because I'm aware that board members haven't yet really had a chance to comment. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to quickly go to Councillor Lynn and then Councillor Scullion. Then I'm going to ask councillors Caffrey and Carter to come back quickly. Um, and then I'm going to hand over to... George and return to my role as glamorous assistant um, and he can chair the questions. What I would suggest, and obviously it's up to George when he's chair, is that we have the cabinet members come back after there's been some questions as well from, uh, from some of the board members so the board members have had a chance to speak. Um, the only board member I currently have uh, wishing to speak uh, who's indicated and they didn't indicate through the chat, but they, I happened to see them as Councillor Kavner. Um, but if people could, as I've said before, go through the chat, that would be great. So um, I'm going to go Councillor Lynn, then Councillor Scullion for any brief remarks you have. Uh, yes, just briefly, Chair. Um, first of all, in the, the question about the public halls is not part of this call-in. It was part of the previous Future Council report, which was in fact released for implementation two or three weeks ago. So I don't propose to spend any time on that. Although I, what I would say, as far as Councillor Carter is concerned, is so that. Sorry, you don't have to spend time on it. You don't have to spend any time on it. Yeah, okay, that's fine. The other point I think it might be useful for me to come back to um, is the point in the call in um, which refers to the need for consultation. And obviously, we, there are a number of things that we have to talk about that relate to public services probably the most prominent of which is the library situation. And just to reassure members that, that actually the whole question about moving to a hub and spoke arrangement and possibly and the possible future of community libraries was the subject of quite an extensive consultation process in 2018, um, which was carried out to the letter really, as per the community libraries toolkit, which is, is produced by the DCMS. Um, and in fact, there were some 16 um, meetings of ward forums and so on held between the 5th of March and the, I think it's the 8th or the 18th of April 2018. So for Councillor Lee to imply that there's been no consultation on this, I'm afraid it's not correct. And really, I just wanted to reassure people that in terms of the libraries, we, uh, notwithstanding the some of the difficulties which have been pointed to by Councillor Carter, and she's absolutely right, nobody's pretending it's going to be easy, but we, but, um, we are optimistic that we will, with those organisations and communities that are interested, we are determined that we will give as much support as we can to them. And we think that actually out of out of the, the changes that we're making, something good can still come. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I'm going to go for brief comments from Councillor Scullion. I just wanted to pick up um, some of the comments from Councillor Carter. Um, she was pointing out that nothing is open on a Sunday. Um, and of course, the, the response to that is, of course, the, the World Wide Web is 24 hours, really, and one of the reasons why things are changing and there is a need for a fresh look at the way in which tourist information is provided is because it is actually available when somebody decides at one in the morning they want to see um, what kind of things they can do in Calderdale. Um, and also, in terms of gifts that people could buy in tourist information centres, they can actually buy those in the other shops and support the local economy in that way. And indeed, some of the paper leaflets that people depend upon, I think, could be distributed 
um, in other in other places, the Peace Hall, for example, um, uh, other other shops and so on that are prepared to take uh, that tourist information, uh, like Cancer Dacre. I definitely still have a paper habit and, and pick up pick up leaflets. But I think the World Wide Web is changing the way in which people access that sort of information. I would absolutely agree with um, Councillor Carter about markets. I actually believe that markets are a springboard for regeneration in Calderdale. They're absolutely central, they're absolutely key to how we regenerate. And we've got a markets working party coming up and we'll be able to discuss some of the detail there. Um, but I think they're absolutely crucial to the whole feel of Calderdale in our culture, what we're about, and I think that's become more important with COVID in terms of fresh food and things local and a local supply chain with local people. Um, uh, so I would just, just agree with those points. I wanted to touch on something else though, finally, in relation to the, um, uh, the third item that's on the call-in notice, sorry, uh, the, the second item that's in the call-in notice, which is that authority on the cabinet paper should not be delegated as laid out within the paper. And um, I, I'm, I'm mystified by that. And it hasn't been mentioned by any of the call-in speakers thus far, because of course, much of it is about, the paper is about investigations and working with partners, etc. There is a general principle that the cabinet and the council as a whole set a policy direction and steer things and lay out the parameters within which the officers must operate. Um, but delegating authority to um, uh, officers as, as laid out in the report is, is perfectly ordinary and a perfectly usual way of, of going on. And Mr. Hughes is here. I don't know if he wants to, to say anything about that through you, Chair, but um, um, I don't see why authority shouldn't be delegated in the usual way that we do these things. What I'm going to quickly do before I go to, count to Mr. Hughes, sorry, not Councillor Hughes, um, almost demoted you, um, is I'm just going to quickly ask Councillor Scullion, um, there was a question asked at the start about furlough and the fact that we didn't choose to furlough staff. Um, I'm not sure if that's you or Councillor Dacre, but I'm not sure it was responded to. And I just want to make sure that kind of some of those key points have been responded to um, in the course of the meeting. So, sorry, I know I'm a fussy chair, um, Councillor Scullion. You're absolutely right, Chair. Uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't picked up. Um, I th most, if not all, of our neighbouring authorities chose not to furlough. And we understand that um, uh, our understanding of the government during the first lockdown was that um, they weren't expecting local authorities to furlough any staff. We um, got permission to basically furlough those customer facing staff whose jobs were entirely dependent on income from the public, such as uh, in the sports centre and the theatre. And we did indeed furlough a number of staff with their permission because you had to seek the person's permission in order to be able to, to furlough them. And obviously in consultation with the trade unions. We haven't furloughed people during this second lockdown, um, partly because of uh, COVID work that we have to do. We are actually having to deploy staff in different, different ways in order to manage the extra tasks that we have got. Um, so yes, we did take advantage of the furlough. I think we were the only or, or one, of, one, of, one or two uh, authorities in West Yorkshire that did so. I'm going to go Mr Hughes and then um, each of the people who did sign a call and wanted to come back. I would plead with everyone to be as brief as they possibly can because, as I say, board members haven't really had a chance to input yet either. either. And I think obviously that would be, uh, you know, in the interest of kind of fairness, I'd like them to have their opportunity. So I'm going to go Mr Hughes next on the uh, delegated authority point. Um, and then I'm going to go um, Councillor Caffrey, Councillor Carter, Councillor Lee, and then I'm going to hand over to George. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, there have been two occasions um, upon which I've had to indicate to the Council that um, through various actions it was acting um, unlawfully. And I 
would never shy away from um, doing that if, in my professional opinion, it was necessary to do so. And there is absolutely no need to do that um, with regard to the delegated authority that has been uh, dealt with in uh, the cabinet report that this is um, being picked up in this discussion, or in fact, in many cabinet reports that have uh, quite routinely but after due and careful consideration by officers and by cabinet, a delegated authority in line with the constitutional position that this authority operates under, as do very, very many, if not all authorities. Delegated authority is just that. It doesn't take away the responsibility that is with the body that gives that delegation. The authority still remains with that parent body and cabinet remains responsible for the decisions that are then taken but the delegation is properly in accordance with the uh, approach that needs to be taken when there is a need for there to be uh, an operational perspective on an item and for officers tasked with the operational decisions that um, uh, deal with the, the way in which the, the council is run on a day-to-day -day basis. Cabinet can always uh, bring a matter back to it. Officers can obviously seek uh, further guidance from cabinet should it should they feel it necessary to do so but the delegated authority that has been granted is perfectly permissible in my my opinion okay thank you okay councillor Caffrey. thank you chair i'm a bit disappointed that someone sort of said that i don't rate the staff at all and they're looking for mass sackings i'm not what the point i made was because nobody's answered it before, that we didn't take advantage of government grant by furloughing staff. Now, Jenny Lynn has just answered that. But that's the first time everybody's told me that, that we could have we could have got more grants if we'd furloughed the staff and, and you know, just paid the 20%. So you've answered the question, which is the first time. The other thing is that our staff do work very, very hard, but I have sometimes said, you know, are they well managed and could they, could, you know, could they work better? That's not a criticism of the staff, it's the organisation. I also said the leaflet that went out could the money that, that was wasted on that, I mean, given to frontline staff to carry out the duties, to say I'm, I'm not supportive of the staff is absolutely ludicrous. A lot of them work very hard. Um, and going back to this leaflet that you, you talked about, one, one lady outside, a 90 somebody outside, outside the news agent said, why are you wasting money on this? I thought you had no money. And she's not the only one. So I mean, they're pulling up your bike saying, what are you wasting all this money for? And I suspect recycling is going to be very, in North Adam, and very bloodless, it's going to be a lot heavier this week than it was last week. Um, I, I heard something else, but it's been such a while since I, I wanted to speak. But mainly, it's mainly about, about the staffing. I, I, I'm concerned about is really about is this council spending its money properly? Are we, are we cutting cutting pe other people's services and not looking at not looking at our own working practices and, and reviewing those? It is not about what the staff do. It's about how the staff are used. Thank you, Chair. Okay, I'm going to, rather than have anyone come back, I'm going to go Councillor Carter, then Councillor Lee, and then I'm going to hand over to George to manage the question section. So, uh, Councillor Mrs Carter. Thank you, Chair. Um, I need to declare an interest, or I don't know whether I need to declare an interest. My oldest daughter is a member of staff, so I don't know whether I'm declaring an interest or not. Because if you're referring to staff, she obviously is involved in it, so it's a bit difficult, you know. Um, I never know whether I should or I shouldn't. <laughs> anyway, um, Councillor Dacre, I understand absolutely all the issues. I stood up at an um, adult health and social care children's conference in Manchester about eight years ago. Don't know whether Councillor Ling was there or not at that point. And I said it was absolutely completely wrong that adult health and social care was funded at local taxation through council tax. I have said it on so many occasions, and I know Councillor Scully, and you've heard me say it, at public public agendas, I've said it all over, I've said it at LGA conferences while it's coming out of my ears, this should be something that is funded from source and should be funded through, through government. It should not be dependent, ever be dependent, on local authority for council tax. And neither should, which I've been saying for even longer, looked after children because that is another thing that impacts on every local authority, puts us into debt, because there is no, absolutely no budgeting procedure with that at all, because it is all dependent on, on being reactive and you can't be proactive. 
So I don't fully understand where you're coming from. My, my concern all along with this has been that it was done prior to the budget process. If you'd have done it through the budget process, I would not have had as much of an issue. It was because it was all started before that. And I still do have a worry about the library facilities because I hear and fully understand what's being said, but the reports actually say that if there's nothing in place for the 1st of April, they will be closed. It doesn't say expressions of interest by the 1st of April and the libraries will be, if, if there is an expression of interest raised in a specific library, we will keep that library open until that's been resolved. It doesn't say that. So I cannot see any way around from what is in the report that what you are delegating to officers, and I fully understand that bit as well, you are delegating them to look at something which is operational from the 1st of April because you're going to close them if they're not taken over by that date. So okay. I, just want it, I just want it to be clear as to what you're going to do because you can't save the money if you don't close them on the 1st of April or somebody's taken them over. And I said about the parish council, and to this point in time, I know it's been called in and backwards and forwards, but not one single member of council staff has consulted me in any way, shape or form about the proposal around Rittenden Library, because they've not. And I, I just feel that we need to be completely upfront with what we're saying. If something cannot be in place to do that funding from the 1st of April, they will have to be closed until funding is available to do it, however which way you do it. And that's what I think needs to be clear and, and, and absolutely transparent. And I would like then that, that anything, I understand delegated powers completely. Right. Anything that is going to change from what is in this report, I think should go back to Cabinet. If okay. officers look at something that is different, then it should go back to Cabinet. Thank you, um, I'm going to very quick. I know you are. Um, I vote very quickly. Um, I'm going to go Councillor Lee, and then I might ask Councillor Lynn to come back on the specific point about the libraries. But then I don't want to go through everyone, and then I'm going to hand over to George for, um, so that he can get his hand on the chair because I can see he's dying to tell me I'm doing a terrible job. Uh, so I'm going to go Councillor Lee next, and then um, I'm going to ask Councillor Lynn to come back on that specific point, just to see if we can get some clarity on what happens if, you know, people on, on expressions of interest versus business plans and so forth. Um, and then I'm going to go, uh, yeah, and then, then George is in charge. Thank God. Um, Councillor Lee. Thank you, Chair. Well done. Um, I'll be brief. That just a comment here. That I think the irony is lost on some of these uh, uh, cabinet members that uh, government austerity is regarded as every meeting. They tell us so. And yet now uh, these proposals uh, that they're making for savings and austerity in Calderdale are the responsible thing to do. And I just wonder how you make the two of them sit together. But uh, on uh, delegated authority, of course, I recognise there's a need for delegated authority. And usually we don't have a problem with delegated authority. And uh, uh, Mr Hughes has made clear um, that there's a need. If there's a need for an operational decision, that's when it's used. But I think our disappointment recently has been whether there was a need and whether there was an emergency that uh, was appropriate. And I'm thinking here of buying um, the, fill the filling station, and I'm thinking of here uh, of funding, emergency funding for a building project, I'll call it that, very recently, when uh, either a cabinet or a council meeting was due very soon after those decisions were taken. And I think that this is such um, a, a contentious issue. Maybe in the future, delegated authority would be appropriate. But I think right now it would not be appropriate because we want to have a more extended debate on this. Thank you, Chair. OK, I'm going to go Councillor Lynn for the specific library point and no other comments. And then I'm going to hand over to George to uh, handle questions and then 
I think he's going to come back more generally for all the cabinet members to comment on the uh, on the further points that were made. Yes, to confirm that if the um, if the board do release the decision for implementation, then it is our intention that um, as of April the first, the libraries which are not intended to continue um, in in as in, as in council management will be closed. But that does not prevent people coming forward in the months that follow with proposals which might enable them to reopen, perhaps not just as libraries, but as actual community hubs. So I hope that clarifies things for Councillor Carton. Thank you. Okay. George, we're waiting for this moment. You're in charge. Thank you uh, so much, Councillor Fentonglin, and thank you as well for, um, I appreciate it must have seemed like it was a planned uh, transition that it was so seamless but it wasn't um, and I hope that my internet is now um, is now uh, up and running as I'm sure it will be so uh, thank you members indeed and thank you cabinet members I'm, I'm really keen to make progress here I think we need to keep our points quite uh, quite brief to the point um, and let's try and make progress through this meeting can I ask uh, Councillor Kavanagh have you got a question and if members would like to ask a question, please do indicate in chat as well. Uh, Councillor Kavanagh first, and I'll go to Councillor Fenton Glynn. Um, so I've just had a few points and then a couple of questions, if that's okay, Chair. Um, my first comment was just to say uh, I'm, I'd want to thank Councillor Lynn has given a lot of support to the group in Mythamroy that are looking at um, trying to replace the current library service with a community hub and it's been really fantastic um the support that she's given but also we've 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 had speakers from other places that are running volunteer libraries so we've had two speakers from sheffield one a counselor somebody who runs the volunteer libraries and it's been really amazing to learn from their experience uh, and work and i think that process together is working so i think what I've heard tonight is that there is a principle of flexibility. So once you've got groups that have said that, you know, and they're working really hard to come up with a plan, that actually, even though the physical space might close, that there's flexibility around that community hub reopening. So that's great to hear. Um, and just to say to Councillor Mrs Carter, you will know infinitely more than I do about parish councils and uh, their processes and timetable. But Hebden Roy Town Council is working very closely with me and others to look at how they can support uh, this new community hub. And what we've decided to do is we're having a community meeting, which will be a consultation to see what need there is. And if there's a demonstrated need, then they will obviously go back to the wider group of councillors around the precept. And they are working with the normal timetable. So uh, it might be worth having a conversation with them, but I'm sure that you know as much as them. Um, so then my only questions are actually about Iskal and the car boot sale, because um, I love a car boot sale. Um, I'm just wondering, uh, I'm not at all going to argue that the council should be running the car boot sale, but have, have we done any similar things in terms of community, ta community taking the car boot sale on? So it's a very quick question. There's lots of people that run car boot sales all over the country every Sunday that is not the council. Uh, so just wondering if we've explored that. And then the other thing around ISCAL was in the detailed review that we're doing on economic inequalities, it's become very, very clear that uh, disabled people, people learning disabilities have been massively disproportionately impacted uh, by COVID in terms of losing jobs, their opportunities. Uh, one woman said to me that she's now not declaring her disability when she's applying for jobs because she thinks she's being directly discriminated against. Um, so I'm just wondering around what, what we're looking at in terms of options around a values-based support going forward. So I know that there's obviously an option to sell that, but I would just argue really strongly that based on what's currently happening, uh, people with disabilities are going to face real issues going forward in terms of employment. So just wondering about the options that have been explored. Indeed. Which cabinet member is best placed to uh, Councillor Scullion? Thank you, Chair. Um, in terms of car boot sales, the answer is yes. I mean, clearly a particularly bad year in terms of a year in which we had, you know, 
major flooding um, and um, uh, COVID-19, COVID um, but, but they had begun to go off. I'm not necessarily sure that uh, council should be running such things. I think there are plenty of private and other enterprises that might well do that in the future and, and officers are looking into that. In terms of ISCAL, I think you're absolutely right. And I would echo what Councillor Carter said earlier. Actually, we have moved away as a society from the, the sheltered workshop, remploy sort of uh, process, but um, we, are, we are looking at how we can actually help as part of our inclusive growth, people back into employment. And I would add to the list that you had, actually people who've had mental health problems and need to be eased back into the world of work because actually the things that work gives you, not just the money, uh, but the companionship, um, the development, um, all of those things. So we would like to try and, um, as you'll see in the paper, uh, explore all the options in terms of ISCAL and see what we can say from that. Because I think it's I think it's important for us in terms of tackling inequalities and inclusi inclusiveness. But clearly there are real concerns about the market that they're in in terms of the future of aviation, corporate hospitality, all of those things. So we're looking at PPE and other different kinds of markets in terms of, of providing a real, really good employment start for a number of people. So we are doing our absolute best, but, but we have to investigate what those markets might be and how we can make it stack up. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Scullion. Uh, Councillor Fenton Glynn. Thank you. I resisted the urge to use chair's privilege earlier and ask my own questions. Um, so I think my first thing is a comment, which was we talked a little bit earlier about prudential borrowing. Um, I only wish that I could borrow at what 1% or 4%, depending which, which estimate you use. And I, you know, I'm glad that we are, you know, when you think about what we borrow to invest in, it's a lot of the things that make this council great, you know. It's, it's the long-term spending on, on development in Halifax Town Centre. It's the, you know, it, it's, it's responding to the floods and, the, you know, and, and those kind of things. So, so I think, I, you know, I, no one wants to spend more money than, uh, than, than is strictly necessary. But I think, you know, if we are investing in the long-term future for this community, I'm always going to support that. Um, my question uh, is potentially a load of rubbish. Um, because I want to uh, ask about waste management. Um, I understand that actually we're going to hold this, this question off until uh, next year and we're looking at uh, negotiating it. Um, I mentioned it in my recent council report and it, I got a few questions on it. Um, and one of them is that people aren't necessarily against the three weekly collections if we can save money on it, as long as we, as long as we improve... Um, the capacity that we have for other things. So for example, larger uh, compost waste bins, larger recycling bins and so forth. I'm just wondering, as you're, as you're um, considering those plans and as you're building them up, uh, if, uh, if you are kind of looking at those, those options um, and you know, obviously in an ideal world, world we'd have weekly bin collections, but I recognize we don't live in an ideal world. So just kind of, want to know that you are thinking kind of about how to mitigate it if we do have to take that step. Can't Lynn. Yeah. Um, yes, Lynn, yeah. yes the, the short answer to your question, are we taking those, um, those uh, considerations about possible need to have enlarged um, storage facilities and everything? Yes, we are. We are still in negotiation and discussions with, with Suez, our contractor. But yes, you're absolutely right. That is one of the, the questions, which is what would be the implications. And of course, that also has implications for what we, can, what we could save um, uh, with some of these measures. Because obviously, if you're having to spend out to spend more money on getting larger waste containers, for example, um, then you have to offset that against the savings that you could make by, for example, moving to a three-weekly um, bin, bin collection. But yes, the short answer is yes, we are thinking about that. But thank you very much for mentioning it. Is that right, Councillor Fenton Glynn? Nod? Yeah, perfect. 
Um, now, I am going to use chair's discretion. I'm going to come to me first, uh, but I had actually intended to come to me. Um, my question is to, it's a serious one. Now, I wasn't actually going to ask this because I asked it at the uh, petition meeting, but given that Ian is here, um, I'd like to ask Ian a specific question, if I may do. Um, it's regarding, I haven't got my notes on me because I've had to move rooms quite quickly, but it's regarding the library's decision and uh, consultation. Now, I understand, now, it is an incredibly person to issue this because I was actually contacted by um, a lawyer from a law firm who is involved in challenging these decisions via judicial review. Um, and she was of the opinion that the library's decision would actually trigger a judicial review. Now, the case is Northamptonshire, I believe, uh, whereby it went to the High Court and actually the court decided that because the decision, the council's decision to close, I don't know, I think it was 21 libraries, um, wasn't actually subject to a consultation. Uh, the decision was unlawful. That was the, the first point. And the second point as well was because an, uh, protected groups as per the Equalities Act weren't taken into account um in terms of the decision and the ramifications of the decision on those protected groups uh it was also quashed on those grounds um now i understand about this expressions of interest point but nonetheless uh, it has been stated that the libraries will still close so therefore that would demonstrate that the decision has not been in made in line with a consultation so I'm just wondering about if Ian could help clear up the legal position on this. Councillor, I'm not going to give legal opinion in a public meeting on the hoof in response to uh, an issue that you've introduced from having spoken to a lawyer from a different area. It's entirely inappropriate to do that. I mean, I'm content that it's actually entirely appropriate because I have actually raised this in a previous meeting. However, nothing came of it. I wasn't we, in that previous meeting, councillor. So if you have a question you wish to put to me about a legal issue upon which you're asking me to give advice to the council, then I would appreciate having that in writing so I can consider it. I'm not dealing with this in a public meeting. That's that's quite that's uh, fair enough. Then therefore, I would contend that I wouldn't feel comfortable releasing this decision today. Um, councillor Dacre, though, I appreciate that you would like to come back. Uh, yes, I just wanted to say that I'm sure that uh, it's actually on behalf of Councillor Lynn in a way that we, I think she's already given some indication of the consultation that's taken place and we can give you some further indication of the consultation that's taken place. In relation to equalities, what I can say is that um, equality impact assessments have been carried out and um, they obviously do take uh, protected characteristics into account when when you complete one of those forms so whilst nobody is going to sit here and give you a legal opinion on a, the prospects of success in a case um, and Ian Hughes has quite rightly refused to do that we I would make those two points and council may wish to say more about the consultation that has taken place thank you I, th I think it's quite an acceptable question to ask especially considering that um 11.1 of the report says quality impact assessments will be undertaken um, resulting from the recommendations within this report. Uh, I think it's it's perfectly acceptable for me as chair of a scrutiny panel to try and seek clarification on a legal position which could be subject, or this decision which could be subject to challenge. Um, Councillor Lynn, and as I say, it's not the first time I've raised this. Sorry, Councillor Lynn. Uh, yes, thank, thank you very much. Um, yes, yes, Councillor Robinson. Um, obviously, it's entirely within your gift if you wish to, um, you know, seek to take the council to court in for some form of legal proceedings to um, attempt to prevent uh, the implementation or to challenge the implementation of this decision. Um, and that's a, that you know that's entirely within within your gift should you wish to do that. All I can see is that it is my contention um, that 
um, as I explained at the beginning of this meeting, um, this process of, move, of, of needing to review our libraries um, has been undertaken very much in line with the toolkit that the DCMS had um, prepared back in, I think, 2015-16, which suggests that it's important to consult communities if you are thinking about changing your library services. And in fact, that process was followed in 2018, and there were, um, uh, there were meetings held in all of the affected areas, including the one that I know you're particularly, you are particularly interested in, um, the, um, uh, and in fact, there were, I, I understand and I believe that you attended a ward forum at which our assistant director um, was present and I believe there were six members of the public were present um, as well in Hipperholm. So I think to imply that we have not taken a, a account of the, um, of the requirements and the advice from, from the Department of Culture, Media and Sport, um, I think is wrong really. Um, and I think, but I think on a more positive note, I would like to say in relation to your own ward that when we did have the, um, the place meeting um, just on, around about a week ago, wasn't it, last Thursday, um, I was really, really pleased to have an opportunity to, um, to talk again with, um, with Mr. Brook um, from the History Society. And I am really looking forward to doing some constructive work with him and his colleagues about what we can do to try to make good use of that building in the future. Thank you. Indeed, thank you. Indeed, I'm not, I'm not actually, just for clarification, I'm not saying that I would seek to challenge this via a judicial review. I'm just saying that indeed it outlines legal exposure. Um, right, on to next question. I've got Councillor Young. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, bearing in mind the Tories have not come up with any alternatives to the proposed budget cuts, I propose to release the decision for implementation. All right, thank I'm you. Prepared to second that. And if you wouldn't mind, I wouldn't mind saying a couple of words before we move to the vote. We've still got some questions to ask. I'm happy to allow more questions to be asked. Um, yeah. I'm glad you... Okay. Yeah. I'll tell, tell you what, before we move to the vote, um, I think it's only fair that we go to Councillor Blagger and Councillor Smith, uh, just as out of courtesy, since they have tabled their questions. Yeah, yeah. Um, but then, yeah, we'll, then we'll go back to the people who have called it in, the councillors have called it in, and then we'll move to the vote. Um, right, Councillor Blagger. Uh, thank you, Chair, and thank you, Chairs, for hosting uh, the, the, um, the meeting this evening. Uh, 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 and I, you know, very much appreciate that there are some difficult decisions. I did actually put forward a, a potential uh, uh, a saving in in terms of uh, 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 you know, big house civic hall, how it could be used, and and I'm more than happy to work with uh, Council Lynn as, as 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 always with these uh, uh, with these things. Uh, uh, I'll, I'll make it very, very brief, uh, Chairs. One of the, my, I've received a, an awful lot of emails in relation to the uh, uh, recycling uh, I I issues, and I appreciate that you are looking further into how how this can actually be managed and, and further investigation. Probably one thought, because it has, I, I do think actually over this period, it, it, we, we've seen a, an awful lot of, a, an awful lot more fly tipping in, in, in the areas. And I think actually from this panel, perhaps a suggestion that. Um, uh, a, a review should be carried out by this uh, CYP uh, uh, scrutiny uh, uh, committee in relation to educating young uh, uh, young people in in an educational environment as to how not to fly tip and, and put the rubbish away. Just a, just a thought, and and it's, it's entirely in your thing. It leads me on to the enforcement. And the enforcement is a, it, it is a big issue. I realise we've got uh, some more officers, you know, uh, in terms of uh, enforcement, but it's the bigger items of enforcement that I'm concerned about. So today we had a very complex and controversial planning application, which was passed for an additional 75 houses with an infill of a, 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 of a quarry. What, what does concern me, actually, with, with, with place conditions 
uh, which may, uh, and one of the, the areas um, is, well, we can take enforcement if they don't meet those conditions. We're already, already stretched with the enforcement department in those big areas. We, we have one large hospital, hospitality organisation which we've been taking legal action for, la for the last 20 years. Uh, so I'm a little bit concerned, actually, with passive more development and equally, um, um, uh, you know, we, we don't have the capacity to actually deal with some of the enforcement issues. So a, a few different things. You, you mentioned uh, the, the asset transfer, which is a different matter. Um, just looking towards more commercialisation, I think. I think we really do need to look towards more commercialization as, as a council. I think there's, there have been reports in the past carried out. I think it will be very much worth revisiting those and I uh, will be more than happy to serve on a, a subcommittee to, to, to help with those as well. So I'll make it very brief. A lot of points have already been made and I don't want to, to wish to take up any uh, any more of your time, Chair, but thank you for allowing me to uh, to, to make some uh, some points. Thank you. No, no problem at all. My pleasure. Thank you, Councillor Dagborough. Uh, cabinet members, would, would uh... Yeah, um, Councillor Lynn. Uh, yes, I, yes, I'm happy to come forward with that. Thank you very much for your comments, Councillor Blackburn. I'm looking forward to working with you uh, about Brighouse Civic, Civic Hall. Um, yes, and the waste services and the problems about fly tipping. Um, I, I have to say that that actually, I, I, you know, and as a ward member, I sometimes have occasion to uh, approach people about enforcement. I'm, I'm keeping my fingers crossed that there might be one incident that I reported today where we might actually be able to, to nail the culprit. So I'm quite excited about that. But you're absolutely right. It is an issue. Um, I think your point about educating young people not to litter. And I have to say, I don't think it's young people that fly tip. I think it's their, I think it's their elders and betters that fly tip, really. Um, but I do think that there's no harm whatsoever in thinking about what, what work is going on, going on in schools. And I think actually schools probably do um, do their level best with that, really. Um, I think your point about the enforcement um, the enforcement service, which, uh, which, as you say, was part of the original cabinet report, which has been uh, and the decision of, of which has been called in today. Um, uh, yes, I think I think you're right. I think certainly in terms of planning enforcement, I think it is stretched. But on the other hand, I would say, um, if I may, that I actually think that the decision which was taken last year um, and, and led very much by our um, uh, um, by the work of, of, uh, of Andrew Pitts, one of our other assistant assistant directors in public services, of bringing the, the various services to different aspects of enforcement, environmental health, planning enforcement and so on, bringing that, those together, I think has really paid off. And I think we can be immensely grateful to all the work that they've done, particularly with the extra law that's been put on them in relation to um, the, the monitoring and, and, and support for the regulations introduced because of the, the um, coronavirus. So I think your points are well made, um, but I, I actually, and I think, I am very conscious that the enforcement service is quite stretched, um, but I think that bringing them together and synchronising them so that you're not just having to kind of report one thing for planning enforcement and another thing for, for environmental health, I think has been quite an improvement. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Dacre? Thank you. Um, I'm just going to come back very quickly on commercialisation because um, I, I'm not sure what this report was prepared for, but I've got the report on commercialisation from November 2020. And while I'm not going to bore everybody with every precise detail, I was pretty happy looking at it, that the council have that at the forefront of the minds all the time. Um, they set up various, um, that they have a member of staff um, dealing with it. They have training programmes for staff on, on what they need to be aware of. They have solicited there's a standing request for suggestions from staff on um, commercialisation um, opportunities. They were, the commercialisation people were intimately involved with the preparation of the future council reports, the ones that we're actually discussing. Um, so they were giving advice on that, for instance, in relation to things like the markets, but also in relation to whether there were other possibilities uh, for um, Victoria Theatre, things like that. So they have been intimately involved in that. And I, I really would hope, Councillor Blackburn, that you would be satisfied that the council does try to maximise commercialise op commercial opportunities wherever possible, but bearing in mind that we are a council and there are limits to what we can do, as you're well aware, um, for instance, when we sell services, there are limits to how much money we can make from those. Um, 
So I just I, I don't want to go into any more detail, but just to make that point, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Smith, or Audrey Smith, don't worry, Brian. <laughs> Yeah, I just wanted to ask if um, if there was any scope for flexibility within the waste recycling pickups, because that idea of bigger bins on those narrow pavement, just because more people will need wheelie bins. But I mean, that can be looked at when you do the, the full review. And the other comment was just about ISCAL. Yeah, I, I think that it is a really necessary service. And I know that you've got on the options there the, the that you're looking into um potentially made into a social enterprise um i think it would be amazing if we could have some sort of really sort of worthwhile skill inclusive and I don't, I don't think it is i don't think it is a sheltered workplace i think i think iscal is is quite broad it's broader than remploy it's it's got a lot of people from a lot of different backgrounds and i just think it's something that we should embrace and yeah it's a shame it's not profitable and i really would like to see it go forward at least to you know be a social enterprise thank you so it's not really a question <laughs> does the cabinet member want to respond or no, perfect. Okay, right. I'm going to go back to um, the councillors who have called it in. Uh, just, just really quick submissions, just to wrap up your your call in here. Uh, I'll go to Councillor Caffrey first. What were you saying? Sorry, George. I didn't ask to speak. Uh, uh, after the call in, so after the discussion, I always go back to the councillors who have called it in. Well, no, I mean, I've listened to everything that's been said and, you know, I, I you know, I, I agree with Howard, you know, more commercialisation is not a bad thing, but I understand it's already in here. But I mean, the, the point I'm making is, you know, I mean, I keep hearing about savings we've made, doing this, that and the other, doing, but they don't materialise. And all we do keep doing is looking for more savings and more savings. But we never seen any savings actually come out of it. It just seems to make the situation worse. So the, the, what I'm asking is, you know, where, where, what, how, why, the, why aren't the finances working? Why aren't these services materialising and servicing debt? And that, that's the crux of my the question, really. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Councillor Carter, any quick summary points? Please, Chair, if that's allowed. I'd just like to thank everybody um, and Cabinet members and officers for, for their uh, input in this meeting. And, you know, you've got to allow democracy and um, the democratic processes that we can call in and we can discuss it. And... Um, stopping discussion will not enhance uh, the democratic process for uh, for anybody, neither for councillors nor for members of the public. And, and I really do feel strongly about that. The only comments I would like to make after all this discussion backwards and forwards is that um, we will have budget council. And at budget council, the savings for next year will be involved, will be included in that budget council paper plus the subsequent savings for years two and three. The problem that I've got is that if we're not going to have a decision until the 1st of April or till the 31st of March or a proper decision about closures, then are they gonna be part of the budget council papers in, in February uh, at budget council? That's why I said I would have preferred it to be a budget council process as opposed to be a standalone process because as it sits at the minute, there is no definite decisions and, and the way that the paper is written, the definite decisions will not be made until the end of March. So I do have, a, I do have an issue around the budget process um, because they're going to have to, they're going to have to raise the ugly head again somewhere along the line. And I do also think that if there is anything different, if there are, if officers have any differences whatsoever, when they come to look at what we've been, what's been, um, put forward from these cabinet papers that it actually does go back to cabinet for for that reconciliation so that we have got a very open transparent process so that the budget all the, these procedures are there for the public to see for me to see as a back bench councillor that everything is being done and that that democratic process is is fully there thank you chair thank you and councillor lee final comments Thank you, Chair. Um, yes, I agree with Councillor Carter's comments. She's put it so succinctly. Uh, Geraldine knows a great deal about the process. And I think this has been done from our perspective. 
in, in some kind of a rush and it's not been th thought through properly. All of the timings that we've heard about are absolutely valid comments. And I also agree that scrutiny is the essence of our democracy. It's our job to try to encourage discussion. If we've got reservations, to table them in a proper manner and try to discuss them, to try to eke out for, from all of the councillors very important opinions that don't appear to have been asked in a public situation. And we saw, I'm looking at Jenny Lynn now, the first call in that we had. Some of the best ideas came out of that meeting with councillors bringing in their own experiences from their own wards to throw into the hat. And I think that's an essential part of, of, of scrutiny. And, and through the chair, I would say, uh, unfortunately, Councillor Young, by moving to this vote, I think has misunderstood our intentions completely. We're calling for prior consultation. That's what it's about, having a, deb a debate. So we can hardly give him some proposals for cost savings until the consultations and investigations have taken place. That's what it was about. So, uh, yeah, I'm glad that we've discussed it. Um, it's the right thing to discuss these things. I don't think one should necessarily vote with party uh, on, on, these, um, on these issues at, at scrutiny panels. I think what we should all be looking for is the very, very best solution for Calderdale. And if we've got reservations about finance going forward, then we should say so. And I don't want to introduce the politics into that. I want to just say we've got real concerns. And I don't want to hear going back to what the Conservatives did 10 years ago every time. It's an old hackneyed argument, and I think we deserve better than that. And All right. I'll move things on. Thank, thank you, Councillor Lee. Um, Councillor Fenton Glynn, so you, you seconded Councillor Young's proposal. You'd like to just come back on, on the point yeah, on explanation. I'd, I'd like to second that, and I'm not going to speak for long. Um, I think we need to release this for implementation. Um, I I mean, firstly, I do welcome this call, and it's, it's always good to discuss these things. Um, the thesis and the antithesis uh, usually leads to a better synthesis, as, uh, as Hegel said. Um, so, you know, I don't think any of us would object to having this debate. I think the reason we need to implement this is because we need to act quickly because much like every other council in the world, in the country, uh, we, are have, we have financial issues because of the coronavirus and the impact that that's had on our economy. I think what's been done is proportionate and right. Um, and I think it kind of moves us to that first stage if you want to start implementing these uh, decisions by April, then we have to move as quickly as we can. Um, no one welcomes these kinds of decisions. Um, and I think that, um, you know, we, we heard the point made that, you know, we criticised the government for uh, their austerity, but we have chosen to, or kind of the, the uh, lead group, the, the cabinet have chosen to make cuts themselves. Obviously that misses out some key points, which is obviously that, uh, Governments can uh, borrow in a different way and governments can set differential tax uh, to people with uh, greater or lesser money. And ultimately, the government chooses uh, where, the, uh, where the council funding or where the funding goes and how much funding goes to the council. Um, and that's why we have been lumbered with the social care crisis and the children's care crisis. And... <clears throat> I don't want to be in a position that Northampton Council was in, where we end up uh, going bust, or that Croydon Council was in, where we end up going bust, because actually the services that we have to run, that we run very well, are those for our most vulnerable citizens. But also, Colzer is a council that already does far above the minimum uh, that we absolutely have to do in terms of the services we run. You know, we run more libraries than any kind of comparably sized councils. Um, I believe at one point we had more libraries than Lancashire. I think that might still be the case. Um, you know, none of us take these decisions lightly, but we're in a really tough place now. 
And I, I just hope that people um, can see past the kind of immediate party issue and see that actually this is about setting the council on a fi sound financial footing for the next, you know, for, in, in, until the budget. And then at the budget, we want to build on that so that we are on a sound financial footing so we can protect our most important residents. So thank you for bringing this call in. And um, I really appreciate the debate that we've had and the nature of the debate, but I think we do need to release our cabinet members to implement this. I'd also just like to quickly thank all of the officers that have given up their time on a uh, Tuesday evening when I know how busy you all are for this meeting. I think that's uh, really well said. Thank you, Councillor Fenton Glynn. So we've got uh, the proposal uh, from Councillor Young. Um, I'm going to propose an amendment to, I think the paper should return to cabinet reason for that is I appreciate there's a need to act quickly however when we've got a budget process around the corner I don't see why we can't and especially when for example there was such a pressing need to make waste savings but then obviously that's subject to consultation and it's going to be part of the budget process when we're looking at libraries we should actually be making the savings currently because a lot of them are closed um, and I, I, I think this should be part of the budget process, which is also subject to consultation in its own right. Um, could I have a seconder for that? Yeah, I'll second it, George, for you. Right, thank you, Councillor Caffrey. Um, right, over to the amendment first. All those in favour, please. Right, so we've got myself, Councillor Caffrey, <laughs> Councillor Caffrey uh, is voting in favour, uh, all those against. So we've got Councillor Young, Councillor Brian Smith, Councillor Audrey Smith, Councillor Kavanagh and Councillor Fenton Glynn. So the amendment falls, uh, we go to the motion, all those in favour of the motion please. That's for release. Uh, Councillor Fenton Glynn, Councillor Black Kavanagh, Councillor Audrey Smith, Councillor Young, and Councillor Smith. All those against? Myself and Councillor Caffrey. So the amendment falls and the motion is carried. Uh, the paper is released. Uh, before you all shoot off, um, I would like to say thank you to members uh, for attending the meeting. I'd also like to say thank you to council officers as well. Um, I think it's clear that there's been quite a lot of frustration around the virtual table tonight, uh, I think from the tone of the discussion. And I'd just like to acknowledge that we are all working uh, flat out at the moment, trying to achieve the best we can achieve. And that goes for councillors, it goes for officers. I know I'm feeling pretty tired, I don't know about you. I feel like we're all running on fumes at the moment. Um, and I think we can't wait just for a bit of um, semi-normality over Christmas. So I just want to say, you know, we might disagree on points, but I think we're all doing it all in the best interests to try and get the best thing for Colladale. Uh, so thank you to officers for attending. Thank you to councillors. Also, thank you to uh, Councillor Fenton Glynn uh, for chairing the first half of the discussion. I think we worked incredibly well uh, and I might try and delegate to you next time as well. <laughs> oh, please do <tell> <laughs> Makes it much harder for me to fall asleep at the back. <laughs> and thank you to cabinet members. Well said, Chair. Thank you very much. And thank thanks, well Deputy said, Chair. Chair. Thank you. Meeting's closed. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye. 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 Bye.